Hey everyone, in this video I want to dive into the new Windows 365 offering. The ability to run this on that. Probably not actually this version of Windows, but you get the general idea. Before we get into that, as always, if this is useful, a like, subscribe, comment and share really is appreciated and hit that bell icon to get notified of new updates. Now, the idea of using remote desktops and published applications is not new. It's been around for a really long time. It was useful, for example, as companies started to move work close to the cloud. Well, hey, let's move the user's experience close to those cloud workloads to minimize latencies. Then always sending over the distance from the user to the cloud are the keystrokes, the mouse moves, and then the updated pixels back to them. So it give me a better experience for disaster recovery scenarios. Hey, I can have my desktops just out there. But then with COVID and the work from home, just the ability to provide users with a consistent desktop experience, no matter where they were. And then with application publishing, where I'm not publishing a full desktop, but just specific applications, the ability to access that application from anywhere and more friendly form factors. With app publishing, it's a lot easier to consume those on phones and other types of mobile device tablets. And there's been this cloud solution in Azure. It kind of evolved from the remote desktop services to these kind of PaaS components to Windows virtual desktops to the Azure virtual desktop we have today. And I want to quickly talk about that solution so we can understand well, how does that compare to Windows 365? And where are some of the similarities to it? So Azure Virtual Desktop really is kind of a, a PaaS solution. I can think about, there are a whole set of components required to make a remote, a desktop publish, an app publishing function. So there is this certain layer of services we need. There's a place for the user to communicate, and it's probably going to come from the internet. So we want to use kind of 443, not RDP. So we often have things like a remote desktop gateway, which will accept that incoming connection and then forward it on by taking out the RDP packet to wherever it's going. We need things like connection brokers to understand, hey, this session is coming in. Do they have an existing session I need to reconnect them to? Um, what should be established for them? give those connections. We have things like web access, actually an entry point so I can find out what is available to me, what's being published to me. And then there's kind of diagnostic functions as well. So all of these things with Azure Virtual Desktop, you don't see. They're really kind of running in really a Microsoft subscription. I don't even pay for those things. That is just part of this overall Azure virtual desktop offering. So then there's obviously a bunch of things that are happening because, okay, that's it in the Microsoft side. That gets me the connectivity, the brains of it. But things have to still run somewhere. So what we absolutely have is a whole bunch of virtual machines. We have these VMs. We have a whole bunch of them. And I might have kind of different sets of these VMs based on different sizes, based on different images. And when I think about the image, hey, I can use client images. So I can have Windows kind of client, 10 mostly, but I think you can do seven. Or I can do server. And there are images from the gallery that Microsoft provide, or absolutely I can bring my own images. I might update them, I have special things put into them. There's even the ability for this Windows 10 Enterprise, I can do something called multi-session. Ordinarily, it's one user per Windows 10 instance. With Windows 10 Enterprise and multi-session, multiple users can share the same VM running Windows 10 Enterprise. So I can really kind of maximize the resources of that VM, get more bang for my buck, so to speak. And these are all built on VM scale sets. We don't really see that, but that's kind of happening. Now, these parts here, this is kind of in the customer subscription. So I, I, I kind of see these things. 
And also what happens is these virtual machines, they actually integrate with a virtual network. So there's kind of a virtual network, and obviously we have subnets, and they belong, they connect into a particular subnet because what's going to happen is that subnet maybe has resources, maybe it has connections like a site-to-site -site VPN or Express Rail to actually go and talk to something on-premises. Because we want to get to things like domain controllers. Because today the way this functions is it's hybrid. I have to join kind of an active directory. So whether those DCs are on-premises and I've got that connectivity or they're running in the cloud, it really doesn't matter it's fundamentally providing me with an active directory. Now, as we kind of know also, we have Azure Active Directory. So we can kind of think about, hey, I also have that cloud-based identity provider, and we're going to kind of sync those things with Azure AD Connect, Azure AD Cloud Sync, to get consistent sets of identities between those. Now, the next thing Azure Virtual Desktop does is obviously these are like real objects, VMs running an image, um, doing something. Those VMs actually establish an outbound connection to the gateway, so they don't have to open up a whole set of ports. So it's very efficient. It does the outbound connection, and through that, then users can connect actually through. But then I create a set of components for Azure Virtual Desktop. I have things like host pools. So I create a host pool. And there's two types. Now, this is where it gets important when I think about Windows 365. There's the idea of pooled. So with pooled, as the name kind of suggests, it's just a set of virtual machines. And as users connect, they'll get connected to one of them, whichever one is kind of available at the time. And there's also the idea of personal. So here, hey, this VM1 is linked to Bob, VM2 is linked to John. Um, so I have that very defined connection between the resources. And then on top of those, what we then create are these kind of app groups. And the app groups, they use a host pool, and I can publish things like, hey, I want to publish the desktop, so that full desktop experience or a certain selection of apps. And I can have multiple sort of definitions going through. Maybe over here I'm just doing desktop. So we define those things and we link the app groups to, as we might guess, kind of groups in our Azure AD, which then exposed when a user actually goes and connects in. So as a user, I say, hey, I'm going to go and connect in through whatever client I might do. It will offer me a certain set based on those configurations. And then, hey, presto, I'm happy I'm using this thing. Now, one thing we have to bear in mind is user state. Users have documents and configurations. So the way that's handled in this picture is what we actually have is for all of these kind of things, we have something called FS Logics. And FS Logics is really used to power all of those kind of user experience, all of their customizations. And that, that state actually gets stored via SMB. So how do I host that? Well, I could host that on a file server running on a VM, or I could use Azure Files. So I have kind of a choice how I decide to host that, but I have that component to handle the state of the user. That's kind of an important thing we need to have. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of different things there. So what do I, as the consumer of this, pay for? Well, I'm paying for those VMs. So this is all kind of a dollar, and this is consumption-based. i.e. how many VMs are running at any one time. And there's functionality for both pooled and personal to kind of start on connect. So if there's not it already running, it goes and starts the VM. And there's ways to actually shut things down if they're not being used. 
So I have those capabilities there to hook into that. I'm not paying for that PaaS portion of it, but there are various licenses required up here. Now that varies depending on, am I connecting to a client OS or a server OS? Things like, um, do I already have Windows 10 Enterprise? Do I need RDS CALs? So there's things I, I might hook into there. Also, one of the things Azure Virtual Desktop can do is it can hook into partner solutions. So things like VMware and Citrix, they have partner solutions that can sit on top of that Azure Virtual Desktop. And one of the things I kind of meant to stress, and this kind of carries on, is by using Azure AD, obviously I get the benefits of Azure AD. Things like conditional access, MFA, identity protection, all of those capabilities I can leverage. So when I look at Azure Virtual Desktop, there's a huge amount of flexibility. Flexibility in terms of, hey, what images am I using? How I manage it? How I scale these out? Um, I have things I have to kind of manage. I have the profiles. But it's, it's a phenomenal solution. It's very scalable. I can do a, a, a lot of great things actually with that. I decide, well, how do I want to upgrade those things? And I might use things like Microsoft Endpoint Manager. Um, what antivirus? Um, am I backing these things up? But we have these like profile solutions. So that's all Azure Virtual Desktop. So then we're here to talk about Windows 365, and I've really not mentioned it yet. So what I want to kind of start with the idea is for Windows 365, let's kind of do uh, a new color just for a second. I'm going to do gold. We'll do gold. If I kind of drew a dotted line around that, in a big way, that's actually powering Windows 365. So we still have VMs. We still have personal. It's a one-to-one. -one. It's only desktops. It's not apps. It's still using these kind of components, but I don't see any of that anymore. All of this stuff, so this is all in now kind of a Microsoft sub, even those VMs, I don't see any of that stuff anymore. That becomes Windows 365. But it's actually a lot more than that. I don't want to undersell what we're doing here. But that is kind of a very simple view. It sits on top of a lot of the investments and power of Azure Virtual Desktop, but it's going to simplify a lot of things as we actually start to look at this. So personal, desktop, using those components, I don't see any of it. What I see is my nice, wonderful Windows 365 service. So let's talk about a few of those things I said. It is Windows 10 only and kind of 11 once that comes out. It is not multi-session. It's kind of the regular Windows 10. It is desktop publishing only, i.e. I am not publishing applications. There's obviously applications on the desktop, but I'm not doing strict app publishing. It's also personal only. It's not pulled. I basically get a desktop per person when I assign them a license for Windows 365, which means this is a perpetual desktop. It does not get deleted. Also means because of that, there is no FS logic. Remember, FS logics is the part that handles profiles because you have this perpetual desktop. Now, there are still technologies like enterprise state roaming. There's things like OneDrive. There's things like Edge can still handle parts of the profile information. But each licensed user is going to get their own perpetual desktop that's managed by the service. It's never going to get deleted. Because it's perpetual, you can personalize it. My data, my configurations, apps, tweaks I'm actually going to make. So the big deal about this, so it's per user per month. 
just like any other kind of Microsoft 365 service, that's the model we're actually going to leverage with this. Now, there are two flavors of this available. We can think about there's actually kind of a business SKU, and there is an enterprise SKU. And each of these has their own kind of set of sizes available that influence the price. Now, let's actually have a quick look at the pricing for these. So if I jump over to the pricing page, so if we look at all of the pricing, notice it gives us the option right at the start, is this business or enterprise? So if we just start looking at business, we can see, hey, based on the number of processors, based on RAM, storage, then we have a certain price. The bigger the VM, essentially, the higher the price goes, which is very logical. There's a resource backing this. Likewise, for enterprise, we have different sizes available based on the size of basically the VM that's powering it. I pay a different amount per user per month, kind of a key point. So that's now, instead of it being consumption based, like with the Azure virtual desktop, so my pricing may vary. But that may in some ways be a good thing. Again, it comes down to flexibility. One of these is ne not necessarily better than the other. Um, I spin these up and down and my price would vary depending on how many are running. In this model, it's just how many users are configured with this desktop. Now for the business, I mean, that's it. There is no other license. credit card, buy it, I'm done. For enterprise, there are additional licensing. Now, you probably already own it. So it's likely using existing license. I.e. there's licenses around kind of Windows 10 Enterprise, there's licensing around things like Microsoft 365 Enterprise, and it does kind of talk about those in that document. So if we keep scrolling down, it talks about, hey, customers have qualifying licenses. If we look down here on the Enterprise side, typically if you have qualified Microsoft 365 licenses, you don't need any additional licenses for the Windows 10 Enterprise or the management with Microsoft Endpoint Manager. So that's kind of a, a big point that we're actually gonna get to in a second, which is, well, okay, so how are these things actually differing? So we have these two flavors, this business and enterprise, why are there two? So let's kind of start on the business side, uh, actually on this, and just to make it clearer, so we'll jump back over. All right, so on the business side, it's 300 max users. Additionally, it, it's, a, it's a very simple experience. It really is this kind of click to provision. That's kind of the whole goal of this. It is Azure AD only. So it does not need regular Active Directory domain services. I get to your domain controllers, nor can it. It cannot integrate with regular Active Directory because there is no virtual network integration. Remember, virtual networks are things we create in Azure subscriptions that have a certain IP space. I create resources in them. As I kind of drew over here, when I have a virtual network, I can connect to other virtual networks. I can connect to other networks like on-premises, and they can all route and talk to each other if I want that. So I can access resources over all those different things. So for the business side, it cannot integrate with virtual networks, which means I can't go and integrate with other Azure services or resources on-prem. It has no concept of that. There are no custom images. There are a set of images from the Microsoft Gallery they maintain. I can only use those. And then there is kind of this self-service reset. So the self-service reset is the idea, hey, rebuild my machine. Take the image, 
redeploy the image, I'll lose my user state, but I can kind of do those things. So that's kind of on the business side. Now on the enterprise side, what they basically say is there's no limit. I don't know if anyone's really tested that yet, but they said there's no limit. I can do as many desktops as I want for this. There's more flexibility. I wouldn't say it's particularly more complicated. Um, there, there's more steps for sure. But if I'm already using things like Microsoft Endpoint Manager, it's literally about five minutes of work and then I'm still using this. Today, it requires hybrid join. So hybrid join means needs regular Active Directory domain services, not Azure AD domain services. It needs actual, actual di Active Directory. Now, from the documentation, they're saying that's going to change in time. Obviously, business today doesn't need Active Directory. Enterprise today does, which really leads into the next thing. This has VNet integration. It's required. Now, there's two parts to that. I tell it a virtual network, so I'm going to hook in this particular set of users, and we'll, I'll show you this in a second. And then it has access to the resources in that virtual network, any connected virtual network, any on-premises networks. So yes, this helps me get to my Active Directory, because that's where I'm going to get to my domain controllers. But it also lets me get to other resources in Azure, on-premises, anything that's connected to that virtual network. So that's actually a useful thing. Even if you don't need AD in the future, that VNet integration is huge. So I can have custom images. I can still use the Microsoft provided ones, but I can also bring my own if that's what I want. It is MEM, Microsoft Endpoint Manager, managed. That's required. So that's kind of that merge of Intune and Configuration Manager. So if I'm using MEM already, I just extend that. The things I'm doing today with policies, everything else, and patching, I'm going to extend that to my Windows 365. They're essentially just a different set of desktops, but I don't have to really treat them any differently. And once again, we have that self-service, um, there's more advanced troubleshooting. Um, so there's various things I can do there as well. But it's really just more flexibility in terms of what I can do with that. And again, I wanted to kind of stress that other networks as well, because that's huge. That ability to hook into resources in Azure and on-premises actually makes that very powerful. But again, I need to know a little bit more what I'm doing, which is why it's maybe one of those, okay, it's a bit more advanced. Oh, the other thing you can do here is universal print. Universal Print is that new Azure cloud-based service that compatible printers or even incompatible printers that use the Universal Print connector, I can now just publish printers. Users can use them from anywhere. And hey, voila, I'm just printing to those things. So that's kind of the, why we have the two different SKUs. So if I'm a smaller company, I just want to quickly get some desktop spun up for my users. Hey, business, very, very simple. I'm going to be up and running like that. If I'm a bigger company and I want more integration, hey, enterprise is probably going to be uh, the better fit. Now, for both of them, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, remember, there's these different components, these different bits. There's still those parts which never showed in your subscription. Then there were VMs and things that would show in my subscription. We don't get any of that. So for both of them, Nothing in your subscription. You don't see anything. This is really more like a Microsoft 365 service. It's just running somewhere. I just absorb and use, hey, this is a great service. Or mostly nothing in your subscription. For the, the enterprise, well, do you know what? Well, a little bit. A 
Um, just because if I think about it, and actually what I want to do super quick, just to make these kind of stand out a little bit, I'm going to change the color just so we can kind of see those clearer. Because let's think about this for a second. Enterprise has to hook into my virtual network. Well, how do I possibly hook into a virtual network? So let's think about this enterprise just for a second. We have, remember, this lovely Windows 365 service. Fantastic. And behind the scenes, it's still creating virtual machines. There's like, it still has to run. And then what I have in my subscription, remember, let's say my customer subscription, is I have a virtual network. And in that virtual network, I have subnets. Now remember, that virtual network may have the domain controllers in it that it needs to talk to. Now in my setup, just to kind of prove this, what I actually do, this VNet, I actually peer to another VNet where I actually have kind of my DC1 and my DC2. That could just as easy, and that's actually in a different subscription, a different tenant. This could just as easily be on-premises, for example, where I have my DCs. And I'm using something like a VPN or Express Route. It doesn't matter, it just needs IP connectivity. And on that VNet, you're going to have the DNS configuration to say, hey, the first DNS server is DC1, the next DNS server is DC2. So we can get to the domain controllers to resolve the Active Directory records. And that's basically it. But in my example, I've got appearing. So the only thing it creates in your virtual network, well, it needs a NIC. So what you'll see in your subscription, which are free, you'll see a NIC created and put in that subnet. That is it. That is the only thing you will see in your subscription. And just to kind of show that super quickly, if I jump over here, if I actually go and look at my subscription, so I created this virtual network, which has literally nothing in it. The only thing I do here is I peer to my two production networks that have domain controllers in them. What I configured on this VNet is to point to domain controllers in those virtual networks. And, but if we actually look at connected devices, there is a NIC. But that NIC is not belonging to any VMs in this subscription. It's just a network interface. But uh, essentially, there's, there's no other resource in my subscription for that network interface. It's used by Windows 365, but there's no VM in my subscription. That is the only thing that I actually see. Now, the other thing I see here, because it's Active Directory integrated, if I was to look at my Active Directory, I actually created a Cloud PC organizational unit, which you can see over here. That's what I configured Windows 365 to use. And so what you see is it actually creates computers in my Active Directory. So that represents the VM that it created for me, for John. I spun this up to look at John. So they're really the only assets I ever see in my environment. Everything else is running kind of in that Microsoft subscription. It's just a service that I am consuming. That's it. I don't see anything. So that's just kind of that little bit. Well, yes, it sticks NICs, which are free, um, into a virtual network. And I'm going to show you that configuration in a second. But to all intents and purposes, I don't see anything. A few other little points. If I'm using business over here, it just auto patches. There's nothing I have to do. So when I think about, hey, the, the OS, this is all auto patch. It uses policy to just auto patch. There's nothing I have to do. Over here, well, I'm going to use this. Whatever my existing kind of patch policy is, I mean, it joins AD. I could even use group policy at this point. 
my patching strategy will be whatever as the enterprise I choose to do. It's not forcing something on you. The enterprise IT admin gets to pick what I want to do. So that's the idea. Windows 365, cloud service, it's very simple no matter which way I go business or enterprise. Enterprise obviously gives me more functionality, more enterprise integration with my AD, with my virtual networks, universal print, custom images. I manage it just like anything else. I can optionally have Defender as well hooked into this. So I have a whole bunch of choices, but now I'm not worrying about Azure Virtual Desktop. I'm not worrying about the variable consumption base per user per month. That's really what I care about. So this is really my dollars, and it's gonna be very consistent and easy to predict because that, that's what I'm paying for. Microsoft actually has a phenomenal document. So if we jump over for a second, so go, now the documentation in general is just great, but Christian has actually created a great page that getting started with Windows 365 Enterprise. And I'll put the link in the description of this video, but it really goes through everything you're going to do. Now you might look at this and you're like, oh, this is, this is big, well, there's a lot of work. I'm gonna show you the key points. And as you'll see, there's actually really not a lot to it. So the main part is obviously, you're gonna buy the service, it's gonna give you some licenses. You're gonna assign those licenses to users. Really, the next point you have to do is in Microsoft Endpoint Manager. And if I kind of go to my devices, we can see there's actually this Windows 365 provisioning section. So I'm going to go over to that Windows 365. And what I have to essentially do is create a provisioning policy. Now, before I can create the provisioning policy, I have to have a few other things. So I need to have my on-premises network connection. And what you can see is here, I have hooked into that development virtual network I showed you earlier. It does a number of checks. Hey, can I resolve names? Can I create a NIC in there? Can I get to my endpoints? Can I apply a PowerShell DSC? So it does some checks to make sure it's good. So I'm gonna create that on-premises network connection. I specify the domain. So as part of that, well, what is the Active Directory I'm actually gonna go and link to? I need to actually be an owner of the subscription of the virtual network. Also, as part of that, I specify things like, hey, um, well, create what OU am I using to actually go and create these objects in? What account am I leveraging? So I, I create that on-premises network connection. That's really the biggest part. And again, for mine, I just created a VNet with nothing in it, but I peered it to the networks that have my domain controllers and then set up the DNS to point to them. Very simple. I can have user settings. So in my case, my user setting is like, hey, I want them to be local admins. So if I select that, you can say, hey, I'm enabling my local admin to be on, so the user's with this, and then I assign it to a group. So I have my remote desktop gateway users group, which I, I kind of had already. Actually, if I click that quick, just so we can see, you can see the details for that peered VNet. You can say, okay, yep, yeah, I select the virtual network, I select the domain, I selected the organizational unit, I created a special account that's gonna be used to do the domain join that has permissions to join things to the domain, and then it has a password. So you can actually go and manage that as well. And then, once I've got past that, I could add custom images. I don't have to, but I have this ability to go and add custom images. Once you've done those things, I can create a provisioning policy. Now my provisioning policy, well, there's really not a lot to it. I have to tell it, well, what on-premise network connection am I using? So that's the VNet to integrate with, and it's telling it the Active Directory to go and join. I select an image, so I selected one of the built-in ones. I selected the Windows 10 Enterprise plus OS optimizations, uh, the 2021 H1 version. There are others available in the gallery. So if I select edit for a second, um, so that's my assignment, actually. I'll just do there. What we'll do is we'll create a new one in a second. And I select the groups to actually assign it to. If I was to create a new provisioning policy over here, once again, I can use the same connection. 
there's a whole bunch of images in the gallery that I can select from. We can see over here a whole set of Windows 10 Enterprises. I can have plus Microsoft 365 apps. There are ones with OS optimizations which make it work with much smaller virtual machines. Maybe it's just running some line of business application I need to make available. But I have a lot of flexibility to this. And that's essentially it at that point. So I create the provisioning policy. And then once users are assigned licenses, it will go and provision them a cloud PC. So here we can see because I, John, have a license, it has gone and created a device for me. And notice that device name is the same name that we actually see in my Active Directory. Notice there's another machine that's disabled that's part of its health checks. When it's going and checking is this network good, it created an object to make sure, hey, I can validate and use this network. So now John essentially should have a machine. And, and that's it. So now John can go and connect. Now just while I'm in this screen, realize this is just part of Microsoft Endpoint Manager. I could use all my existing functionality to deploy apps, to patch it, to manage, to do everything else. I can create special groups. Like I actually created a group here of all my cloud PCs if I look at the members, I can see there's John's machine. How am I doing that? I just create a dynamic membership rule to say, is the device model containing cloud PC? That's it. And then it's going to automatically, so I could now target my cloud PCs slightly differently if I wanted to. But now my user end experience, well, firstly, I could just go to my apps. As me, who's been assigned this a license, and remember, that's all I have to do, in my My Apps, hey, look what I see. I see Windows 365 available to me. I can just click that. I can also just go to the Windows 365 portal. And I can see, hey, look, I got my default provisioning policy. That's that policy I actually created over there. Now, the first time I actually go in and connect, it'll guide me through a little wizard. I can select certain things, but essentially here I have my desktop. Now I can open this in the browser. So it's going to go and connect me through. It's asking me, hey, which things do you actually want to map through? Like clipboard, microphone, printer. Now it's going and connecting. It's going to make me type in my password. So remember, this is hooked in at this point. Various things. No, I'm not going to say my password. And now I'm connecting. So this is running in the cloud. As the end user, I really didn't have to do anything. It's being managed by my organization. This is enterprise member. In a consistent way, I could have multiple. And there, I am up and running. This is my machine. I can add applications. I'm a local admin, remember, it, via my policy. I can change anything I want. This is my environment. I can access this from anywhere. Now, I'm showing this from the browser, but I can use it across a whole bunch of platforms. If we actually look at what I can access this from, yes, there's the portal. I can also access it from the remote desktop client. And then also, there's a whole bunch of mobile, Mac OS, iPad, Android, there's clients for these. And there's different kind of sets of functionalities and that I will get with these. Because there's a whole bunch of options, a whole set of different platforms supported to actually leverage this functionality. But the end result is I get this lovely, lovely desktop actually running. And I, as the user, really didn't have to do anything. Remember the two SKUs, depending on my organization. With business, I'm not using Microsoft Endpoint Manager. It's really, hey, I want to buy 50 licenses, assign them to these 50 users, and I'm done. That's really it. They would then go and connect, and their Azure AD joined. They can go and access stuff on the internet, anything that's internet available. Enterprise, again, I still go and click, click, buy 500 licenses. I still just assign them to users. But then the extra step is via Microsoft Endpoint Manager, I integrate with virtual network. 
that lets me integrate with an Active Directory, which in the future may not be required, but I still like the VNet integration. I still may want the AD integration, so I can get to other resources in Azure, in connected networks, on-premises. We have the ability for things like custom images. We have things like universal print, which again is an important thing for my desktop, so I can print to all different devices wherever they are. But it, it's, it's a super clean experience for that end user, and I'm up and running. So, so again, I mean, that, that's really it. This is my wonderful Windows 365 desktop. <coughs> it's still Azure Virtual Desktop. It's not to say that's going away. There are different use cases. Again, this is this very constant, very minimal set of management required over here, very predictable costing. Azure Virtual Desktop is this consumption-based costing. I have more power over the configuration, but with more power comes more responsibility. Um, we have things like the FS Logic. There's different backup things going on here to protect those. So this is kind of a, a more advanced solution. I have more flexibility, but it all comes down to what do I need? What do I want? And so I, I think now you, you have choice. I think, hey, if I really just want to get those desktops out there, if I want some consistent management, hey, Windows 365 Enterprise is probably a great fit for a lot of organizations. If I'm not using MEM and I'm a smaller company, maybe I just want to stand up some desktops. Also, great option. So you have choice. I really hope that helped kind of understand what is Windows 365. As always, there's a lot of work goes into producing these. Please, please help out, hit that subscribe, um, like button. Until next time, take care.